Hey guys, so today in this video, what I wanted to do is a fully comprehensive GPU overclocking and software optimization tutorial. And the reason why I wanted to make this video is because I had a lot of people commenting on my earlier videos about how they wanted to have a more in-depth guide on all of the different things that they could do to improve their GPU performance and boost their frame rate. And so starting off, the first thing you guys are gonna to wanna to do is go into your BIOS and enable something called a resizable bar. And you'll find it usually in your settings tab near a certain um, feature called above 4G decoding. And then you'll usually find resizable bar support around there. You're going to want to enable both of those. And what that's going to do is it allows your GPU and your CPU to access larger sizes. So your CPU normally accesses your GPU in 256 chunks, size chunks, but now resizable bar allows the CPU to use the full uh, frame buffer size if it so chooses. And this can increase performance in some games by up to 10 to 20%. And in some games it can reduce performance by 10 to 20%. But the problem is, is that NVIDIA specifically locks down resizable bar support and some games benefit from resizable bar, but NVIDIA doesn't enable them. And so that's essentially what we're doing today is unlocking that for games that we know either do benefit or um, have some sort of like knowledge that they do uh, other than just NVIDIA's direct word of mouth. And so if we download a tool called NVIDIA Profile Inspector, if we open it up, what we're going to want to do is look for the very, very bottom right here in the five common tab. What we're going to want to do is click enabled. Some people recommend doing the um, Assassin's Creed Battlefield 5 one. I do the F1 2022, 2021 version, and then the Rift Breaker for the size limit. I just found that that gave the best performance, but I recommend you guys test it for yourself and see which ones work best for you. And also make sure that the game you're enabling it with actually does benefit from uh, the actual enabling of this feature. And that will be universal. And then you're going to want to hit apply. And then if we scroll down to the very, very bottom, what we're going to look for is a specific feature called memory allocation policy. And what we're going to want to do is set this to aggressive pre-allocation rather than policy as needed, because what this will do is it will give the ability to allocate the memory a much larger and much more uh, lenient way of allocating the memory rather than being uh, either pre-determined or pre-sized essentially. So setting it to aggressive pre-allocation will help a ton with that for, for like stuttering and FPS fixes and stuff. Then you wanna hit apply and then we can close out of this. Now, the next one that I wanted to talk about is the actual NVIDIA control panel, because this is something that a lot of people uh, get a lot of different mixed opinions about, but I wanted to provide actual information and actually provide details about what it actually does. So the way that you access your NVIDIA control panel is if you right click on your desktop, what that's going to do is it's going to pull up this sort of software right here. And if you go down to the manage 3D settings, I'm going to be only covering about three or four of them that tend to get the most controversy or things that people tend to just immediately say to disable, but they don't actually inform people about what it does. And so starting off anisotropic filtering, what this does is it essentially improves um, the actual image quality of things at a distance and at an angle. So it can be one or the other, but to give you an example in a game that is being played, if you actually look at just how distorted no anti-sotropic filtering looks, it looks horrible. You can barely even see past like the first six of these steps. But now with the anti-sotropic filtering, it gives you much clearer defined information. And the actual performance impact is literally negligible. It's like two frames. So I recommend that you guys actually don't just disable anisotropic filtering. I recommend that you keep it to application controlled and control it on a by game basis because some versions of anisotropic filtering have only 1x or 2x or some games have all the way up to as high as 16x. So I recommend that you guys just keep it application controlled for now. And then the next thing is gamma correction. And what gamma correction does is it essentially improves the over over um, correcting of the gamma for certain games. And what that looks like is something like this, where instead of it being a very, very dark room where the gamma is really intense and the orange kind of looks like um, really vibrant and the room just looks a lot less clear, gamma correction pulls that back and it essentially fixes those kind of issues where now it just looks like a room with a little bit of lighting rather than like four laser beams shooting straight down. So keep gamma correction on because it can make a lot of games look a lot nicer. And then for anti-aliasing mode, well, 
to define anti-aliasing, you have to understand what aliasing is. And what aliasing is, is essentially the staircase effect that you see for um, lines at a distance or essentially when they're being rendered, where normally it looks this very pixelated kind of choppy look at a distance. But with anti-aliasing, it blends them together by using pixels surrounding that block and making a mesh, so to speak. And this can really improve things, for example, like power lines or really thin surfaces. And so some people are more sensitive to what's um, this kind of feature, they call it jaggies. So sometimes it's best to enable it or disable it, but I keep it application controlled because some games have much better anti-aliasing implementations and some don't. Some take a lot of performance, some don't. So I recommend keeping it application controlled so that way you don't just immediately disable it, have jaggies everywhere, and then have conflicting driver path information and stuff. Next thing is the low latency mode. I recommend keeping this off. There is conflicting information about this online about how it can increase input lag. I'll provide a link for that in the description, but for the meantime, keep it on off. It doesn't reduce input lag. And then for the monitor technology, keep it to G-Sync. G-Sync essentially improves the screen tearing when your frame rate is um, not able to match up with your refresh rate or essentially exceed it. And screen tearing can be really disorientating for some people. So if you don't like G-Sync, it can increase a little bit of your input lag, but only like a few milliseconds, so it's not really that much. If you want to disable it, you just go into here, you uncheck that, and then you hit apply at the bottom. But I like to keep mine, so, you know, I keep it on as it is. But going down, finally, to the last few. OpenGL GDI compatibility, keep that to prefer performance because it only affects a very small category of people. And then OpenGL rendering GPU, you're going to want to select your GPU. So mine's the 4090. Power management mode, this is a big one. Set the preferred maximum performance. That's going to be the biggest thing. And then the preferred refresh rate, you're going to want to set it to highest available. Shader cache size, unlimited. And for the anisotropic sample optimizations, I recommend keeping this one on because it specifically mentions um, limiting the amount for the size of the texels. And essentially what I've kind of come to understand is that the texel size is essentially the raw size of the actual um, image itself in terms of the amount of like pixels it takes up. And so it will do its best to try not to overly use anisotropic filtering for things that probably don't need it that much in terms of raw texel size. So large, large images that you probably don't really need to view very much. And then for the negative LOD bias, this sharpens the stationary image, but introduces aliasing when the scene is in motion. So essentially this has the um, ability, kind of like how you would assume like a sharpness filter will. And when it has that sharpness filter, it has the problem where as soon as an image starts to move really fast, we know that aliasing is what causes this staircasing effect. So if you're somebody that is very sensitive to um, the and I like the anti-aliasing or the aliasing of an image, what I recommend you guys do is you actually keep this to allow or actually to clamp. So if you're sensitive to the aliasing, set it to clamp. If you're not sensitive to the aliasing, then keep it to allow. That'll give you guys essentially options so that way you can fix certain things that are visual anomalies to you. And then trilinear optimization. What trilinear optimization does is essentially it says that it allows for bilinear filtering in situations where trilinear is not necessary. But if you actually look at what bilinear versus trilinear looks like, the difference is so massive that it kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense to disable it anyway. So for example, you see how terribly these are bent, blended? Where bilinear, it looks like five, five colors perfectly lined up. Whereas with trilinear, it still preserves some of that information. So I recommend keeping it off just because I, there aren't a very lot of situations where I can think where having only bilinear would look better in any way. And so for threaded optimization, keep that one on. That allows you to use more threads for your CPU, which is huge. If you use G-Sync, then you're going to want to keep vertical sync on. Otherwise, G-Sync won't work. And then the next thing is the desktop color settings. This will give you a massive boost in your color um, saturation we'll say so it make the look the image look a lot more bright and a lot more uh, poppy so to speak and if you go and set this digital vibrance from 50 to 100 it can make the image look infinitely better so i recommend doing that and then for the change resolution you're going to want to make sure you're at your highest refresh rate and so if you select your monitor and then you go into here you'll see your actual refresh rate is the highest minus 270 
that's what essentially my highest refresh rate is. And that's why we want to keep it in the manage 3D settings at highest available. So once we're done with all that stuff, we can close out of this. And then the next thing we're going to be talking about is um, lastly, actually. So the next thing is essentially um, other examples of what bilinear and trilinear look like. So bilinear, again, just already trilinear was starting to stretch the amount of anisotropic filtering that would be acceptable. And then uh, bilinear just takes it to the final extreme where uh, basically the entire thing is just one big blur. Whereas even like the lightest amount of anisotropic filtering is still preserved, especially like around here and right here where it's no longer preserved. So I recommend keeping that to enabled. But the next thing is that we're going to be talking about GPU overclocking with MSI Afterburner. And the best way to do this is essentially what you're going to do is you're going to see something like this. You're going to want to open up your settings and go to unlock voltage control, unlock voltage monitoring, and force voltage control constant or force, force constant voltage. And then what that's going to do is it's going to make you restart your MSI afterburner. And then you're going to want to set the core voltage to 100%. That essentially actually does a lot for the newer GPUs like the 30 and 40 series because it actually um, unlocks a higher power state. So keep that one at 100%. And then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to put your power limit slider to obviously the maximum that it can be. And then for the next part, you're going to want to have a GPU stress testing software. I recommend doing something like Firmark, just be, actually maybe not Firmark, do like Heaven Benchmark because Firmark is very GPU intensive. So to give a demonstration as to um, how to stress test or how to overclock. What we're going to do is we're just going to have a um, stress test open on the side. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my GPU's um, core clock by 15 megahertz increments. And then what that's going to do is it's going to slowly step up the actual frequency as so long as I keep going up and up. And the benefit of this is that if you reach a very high core clock overclock and you're still stable and you're not crashing, then that means that you essentially are getting significantly more free performance. So mine can go all the way up to 200 before it starts having issues. And my memory clock can go all the way up to 1200. This won't damage your card, so I wouldn't worry about it too much, but I wouldn't use Firmark because I know Firmark is kind of special in terms of there, there are some weird things that it does. And so once you do that and you're no longer crashing, then what we're going to do is we're going to change the essentially the base clock of the actual GPU. Now, how do we do that? So since we know that our curve is offset by 200 megahertz, now we need to find the base clock where at the lowest voltage, our frequency is still supported. And so for me, on my GPU, you'll notice that this is my profile where I've raised the actual base clock all the way up to 2300 megahertz rather than 1500 megahertz. So even in the worst case scenarios, my GPU will still be able to support 2300 megahertz regardless of the actual, um, regardless of the actual like voltage going in and out. So essentially the clock fluctuation and this can help prevent um, instability issues. And then if you want to change the actual um, power state, so lock it to the highest power state with the highest voltage, what you're going to want to do is you're going to push L and then that's going to bring up a little yellow line. And then you're going to want to hit the check mark right here. And then that will essentially lock the GPU power state to its highest frequency that you've wanted to select specifically. Um, each person's is different. So obviously it'll take some experimentation and testing, but that's just the first things that we want to do. And then once we have that set up, um, the best way, the next few tricks are going to be slightly different. So these are going to be focusing more on deep loading and adding certain features that we do like. And so if we go into the software called NV Slimmer, what this allows us to do is essentially it allows us to modify and debloat the actual NVIDIA drivers themselves. And so I've downloaded one of the NVIDIA drivers before. And so here's the one right here. And then once you download it and then install it and push it into this certain software, what it's going to do is it's going to unpack all of the stuff that's in that software. And the reason why this is super useful is because there is a lot of stuff that people just don't particularly care about, like GeForce Experience and Shadow Play are two easy ones that people just do not care about. People don't like the telemetry, like being tracked. People don't need the virtual drivers for the audio and stuff. It just depends on your use cases, but some people are different. So I recommend that you guys, you know, experiment and see stuff that you can live without. And then obviously repackage it 
install it, apply it, do all that stuff. And then that will give you a new modified version of the drivers that can actually improve the um, performance of it because it's no longer filled with a bunch of this junk like the NV containers, the telemetry and stuff like that. But by doing that, you also remove those features. So if you do remove them, you will have to re-download that driver in order to get the actual features back. So it's a trade-off. The next thing is DLSS Swapper. And what DLSS Swapper does is it allows us to actually um, change the DLSS version for games that we use. And not all games you want to do this on. So for example, don't do this on the um, multiplayer games that have this because they don't always work very well. They can, so you can experiment, but they don't always work very well. And then the way that you do that is you just go into the bottom right here and then you just click download. I've already downloaded the 3.1.11, which is the newest one. So then if we go back into that tab and then we can just go and click and select whichever one of these and then we can just click swap and then that will automatically update it and that will change the number. Now we have the correct DLSS version and then we can actually benefit from those features like stuff that prevents ghosting on DLSS. So after doing that, the next thing is something super simple, which is disabling hardware acceleration in the games that you play. Hardware, hardware acceleration is essentially what runs in a lot of different software that's sort of socialized focused. So if you see right here, for example, in Discord, if you go into the voice and video tab, you'll notice that hardware acceleration will be enabled. Disable that because it uses your GPU resources and that can be a problem. If we go into the advanced tab as well, you'll have to disable hardware acceleration. As it says, it will force a restart from your system, or not your system, just your Discord application, but should relaunch, shouldn't have any issues. And that will help kind of preserve some of your um, GPU resources and games because hardware acceleration can be pretty taxing. And it's in a bunch of other launchers too, like Battle.net, for example. If you go into the settings tab on the top, disable browser acceleration, hardware acceleration. That's just another example of another type of software that has hardware acceleration. So make sure you're actually checking which software has it. The next is you're going to want to type in graphics on the bottom left of your search and go into here and then enable hardware accelerated GPU scheduling. I know we're disabling hardware acceleration in some applications, but GPU scheduling is different than that. It essentially allows for context switching where your GPU can do one task at one moment and then it can for a brief period of time, interrupt it in order to do something else, which can improve the system performance. And in some games, it's really nice. If you go into browse, you'll usually find the actual EXE game inside of the Steam libraries or the um, folders of the different games that you play. And then you can just go and change the actual performance to high performance and then click save. Some games really like to benefit from this, like Tarkov and Elden Ring. So you guys want to experiment with that and see if yours does. So. Now that we've talked about all of that, the next thing we're going to talk about is GPU BIOS flashing. And the reason why GPU's BIOS flashing is really useful is because it allows us to unlock higher power target states for our GPU. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, this is my graphics card right here. And the power limit on this graphics card with its BIOS is 450 with a max of 479. But with the actual other GPU that's very similar, the same Gigabyte RTX 4090, but it's the Gaming OC version, that BIOS has a power target of 600. So I can essentially set that significantly higher with a different BIOS. However, I do not recommend that you guys do this unless you are fully aware of the consequences, which can be a GPU no longer working. It can brick your GPU if you are not careful. So I do not recommend doing this because most people generally are just not comfortable with that level of experimentation. I did it for my GPU, so it does work. You just want to make sure that you're not going to do this without knowing exactly what's going to happen next, because some GPUs, it may seem obvious that you could BIOS flash, but not every BIOS is supported that same way. So some BIOSes, even though they're very much identical, sometimes they enable features that can break it. And so there are a bunch of different commands that I'll leave, for example, inside of here, and I'll post them online and kind of give you guys an idea. But if you go into um, GPU Z and you go and you click save BIOS right here, that will save the actual original BIOS that is on your graphics card right now. And that's going to help you guys get essentially um, save that BIOS. So when you do flash it and you do enter in those commands, you're not risking bricking your graphics card. And again, I'll link a video in the description on how to do that. But 
Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hopefully it was informative and you appreciate all of the different things. Please consider liking, subscribing, favoriting, all of that fun stuff. Um, make sure that you guys share this, like, comment, all that stuff. Anyway, guys, thank you guys for watching again. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. My name is Savaterix, and I'm out.